This is Michael Altos recording Clinical Pharmacology of Inhalational Anesthetics, Part 3. The last thing I'd like to talk about is malignant hyperthermia, which you may have encountered in some of your other lectures, but I think it's an important pharmacological concept for us to cover. Malignant hyperthermia is a biochemical response which is triggered by certain anesthetic drugs in certain susceptible people. It's genetically inherited with autosomal dominant inheritance, which means you only need one copy from either parent. The incident is unknown because it's familial. It can be anywhere between 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 60,000. And this is why we always, always ask for a family history. All family members of an MH patient are considered to be susceptible to MH until been proven otherwise. Even patients who have had multiple anesthetics before with no problem have subsequently died of malignant hyperthermia. So you cannot rely on previous safe anesthetics as a guarantee that the patient does not have MH. If you have a high suspicion for MH, you should not give triggering agents. There is only one definitive diagnosis for MH right now, and it's called the caffeine halothane contracture test. It needs to be done at a specialized center, of which there are only a few throughout the country. They have to put you under anesthesia, a non-triggering anesthetic, I would imagine. They take a muscle biopsy, and from there it goes to a lab where they do a test. There's lots of genetic testing for MH, but there are so many different mutations that we could identify MH, but it's hard to definitively rule out MH. There does seem to be a small association between heat stroke and susceptibility for MH. What's going on with MH? Well, it happens deep inside the skeletal muscles, and the muscles release calcium, and the muscle becomes contracted, and it sustains contraction. And we see this in all of the muscles, most notably in the masseter muscles, the muscles of the jaw. And if you give more succinylcholine, which would be a terrible idea, or even non-depolarizers like rock or vecuronium, you cannot relieve the rigidity because the rigidity occurs in the muscle cell itself. MH is a hypermetabolic syndrome. This rigidity and constant contraction causes heat production and fever. Patients become hypoxemic from using up oxygen. They become acidotic. The PaCO2 increases and they become tachycardic. The muscles begin to break down, which is called rhabdomyolysis, which releases potassium into the bloodstream and creatinine kinase. Patients develop arrhythmias, myoglobinuria, which can lead to renal failure. What triggers malignant hyperthermia? All volatile anesthetic agents, which means everything except nitrous oxide and xenon, and succinylcholine. Nitrous and all IV medications are okay. It's just volatile agents and succinylcholine. We prevent MH by avoiding triggers and flushing the anesthesia machine. The more modern anesthesia machines are complex and are not easily flushed just with 10 minutes of high flow oxygen. There are charcoal absorbers that can be attached to the machine to try to remove all traces of volatile agents. And you should check with your anesthesia technician or your department's protocols to know how to prepare a machine for MH patients. Some institutions have a dedicated trigger-free machine that can be used that's never been exposed to volatile agents. If a patient does have malignant hyperthermia, the first step is to stop all triggering agents and call for help. The main drug for treating malignant hyperthermia is dantrolene, 2.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. It is available in the MH kit that is standard required at every location that provides anesthesia. Dantrolene is a kind of muscle relaxant, and it basically reduces calcium release. It has to be dissolved in water, and some formulations are very hard to dissolve, so that's why you need extra hands, and you may need to warm the water to get it to dissolve. The more modern formulations are easier to dissolve. Other treatments include giving high-flow oxygen, cooling the patient, which may be done with ice, with gastric lavage, with pouring iced water into the abdominal cavity if it's surgically opened, 
packing ice in the head, the armpits, and the groin, a cooling blanket, and cool IV fluids. Acidosis and electrolytes need to be aggressively managed, and the patient should be taken to the ICU. MH can occur in the operating room or postoperatively, and it can recur within 24 to 36 hours. If you have a patient with MH, you, there is a hotline that can be called, which is always staffed, and there's a website for the M House, Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the U.S. You should be aware that not every death under anesthesia is due to MH. For example, a young patient with undiagnosed muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy often doesn't present itself until age six or seven or eight. So a young, usually a male, because it's a sex-linked disease, four years old, comes to the operating room, gets succinylcholine and dies. And it may be due to a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest. The muscular dystrophy, which has not yet presented itself clinically, causes an increase in acetylcholine receptors, and the succinylcholine is what actually caused the patient to die. But this is not MH. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome requires no MH precautions. It's a condition related to the administration of antipsychotic drugs, and it leads to some pretty concerning symptoms, hyperthermia, hypertonic muscles, mental status changes, fever, obviously makes people think of, fever and rigidity makes people think of MH, but you do not need to take MH precautions in patients who have a history of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. You may give a patient succinylcholine and they will have masseter muscle rigidity, which is trismus, which makes it difficult to open their jaw. Mild rigidity is normal in response to succinylcholine. And about 1% of children who get halothane or sevoflurane and get sucks develop MMR. But if people get a real case of it that's just not mild, we should assume it's MH and begin treatment just to be safe. And if it's an elective case and they develop this, I would cancel the case just to make sure that we get them stabilized and that nothing is going wrong. If patients do develop this, they should remain in the hospital for 12 to 24 hours and should be monitored to make sure they haven't developed rhabdomyolysis, breakdown of muscle. Please make note of any questions. One last slide to show you here, and this is reproduced in your notes. This is the kind of chart that I like to make sometimes when I'm learning about a lot of new drugs. And it just lets me look quickly and see what are some of the notable features about each drug. So I can see trends and I can see outliers here. I can see, for example, that nitrous oxide seems to have a lot less cardiac effects than some of the other volatile agents. And I can see it has a different effect on the brain than the volatile agents. I can see which drugs undergo metabolism and which don't. And I can see this general trend of what most of the volatile agents do to the heart, to the lungs, to the brain. This might be helpful for you, and I encourage you to make charts like this uh, when you learn about different kinds of drugs. That's it. We'll stop here and pick up again next week.